Hey there, welcome to The Uplift. We've got a great show for you today. Great cast of characters as well, including these, a football player who made a selfless sacrifice to help a teammate. Also, a former Little Leaguer who got to work with a professional baseball player way back in 1962. More than 60 years later, he's thanking that player for his kindness. Plus, meet the Carpenters working to restore the iconic Notre Dame Cathedral Spire. Also, summer vacation coming to an end soon. That's a sad fact for some kids. But do you know the origins of summer break? We'll tell you. Also, you're going to go on a 42-stop ice cream trail where the sweet treat is not the only thing they are serving up. Good enough for me, though. All that plus more heartwarming stories you need to see. You're watching The Uplift. Hello again, welcome to The Uplift. We're the show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes, you and me as well. I'm Tony DeCopel, and we're gonna begin here. For many school-age kids, summer break is over, and it is actually back to school time. Say it ain't so. For some of them, it's sad. They don't like seeing the summer slip by, but have you ever stopped to wonder why we even have a summer break? We take it for granted. Well, CBS Minnesota's Jeff Wagner looked into the question. Are you sad that summer break's coming to an end? Yeah, a little bit. Um, kind of mixed feelings. I don't really know. Maybe you excited to see friends at school yeah. again? Mm hmm But then again, it's school. Yeah, so. Do you have any idea where summer break started or why you get eight to 12 weeks off? Probably because it was boring. Probably because what? It was boring. Because school was boring. Families needing their kids home to work if they were farming. Mom is on the right track, according to Dr. James Peterson. In some sources, you'll find that the school calendar, they say, is the clock for America. He's a superintendent and former teacher who studied the history of the modern school year calendar. Is it true that summer break was made so, so farm kids could have some time to get in the fields? So it's partially true, yes. Rural students often got breaks in the spring for planting and late summer for harvest. But in the cases for the urban students, uh, in the uh, Boston and, and uh, New York they had 240 school days in the 1800s. When did summer break become the norm in the U.S.? It was sometime in the, the early 1900s. In urban communities, child labor laws and unions played a role, as well as a desire for families to take vacations in the summer. We went to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We go up to our cabin by Grand Marais. Dr. Peterson says that's when urban and rural school districts decided their schedules should match up. Rock on, girl. The summer job market has also become reliant on teenagers who get a few months off from school. There is a large economy that runs on the fact that we have summer vacation. Would year-round school make kids uh, better or to simply put it, just be smarter? So any kind of learning that occurs will decrease uh, or even eliminate summer fade. I've had um, one of my sons attend a year-round school and it was quite valuable. Year-round school is a transition some districts have made, but Dr. Peterson feels simply adding some form of learning in the summer can be helpful. It could be field trips, it could be museums, it could be putting on a play. All those things are educational. In the 1600s, that's like 400 years ago, kids are going to school all year. Yeah, and I was really young then. I'm uplifted by a good dad joke, and that was one. Coming up in just a moment, 1962, his pitching needed a little help, so a little leaguer linked up with a professional baseball player. Now we're more than 60 years later, and he wanted to say thanks to that player. They had a reunion you need to see. Plus, there's no better summer treat than ice cream, so how about 42 scoops of ice cream? Dana Jacobson takes us to New Hampshire's Ice Cream Trail, where they are serving up more than just sweet, sweet treats. willing to give up my scholarship and to give it to Zach Hunt. I've never heard, I've never seen anything like that ever before. Where are you, Dooley? That is head coach Chris Crichton. He's the football coach at Eastern Michigan University. And you're just watching a recent team meeting in which Crichton shared how Brian Dooley quite selflessly gave up his own scholarship to teammate Zach Conti, who worked multiple jobs to make ends meet prior to that moment. Also, Conti could afford school and play on the team. 
We want to move on now to another sports story. Back in 1962, dial it back, a 10-year-old little leaguer got the opportunity to learn from a baseball great. Well, more than 60 years later now, he got to thank that player, a player who inspired him. Here's Chris Van Cleef. The 1962 then minor league San Diego Padres had a great year, but it's what happened off the field that changed the life of one young baseball fan. I was fast, but I was dangerous. Ten-year-old Merle Ledford's pitching needed help. His little league coach scored him time with Padres pitcher Zach Monroe, who won a World Series with the 1958 Yankees. He taught me to stay focused. Sometimes you're not going to throw strikes. Shake it off. You've got a job to do. Lessons he believed helped him become a better student, then a better lawyer, baseball coach, and father. 61 years later, Ledford wanted to say thank you to Monroe writing to Major League Baseball for help delivering this message. Dear Mr. Monroe, this caption, thank you. Good to see you, fella. Good to see you, Zach. Setting up a ball game reunion 2,000 miles away in Peoria, Illinois, between the Little League wild man and the now 92-year-old pro ball player. Whatever I said stuck with him. Somebody went a lot further than I did. And I'm talking about an attorney. What did today mean to you? Just being able to thank a guy that helped me out when I was little and share with him the, hey, look, you did something good. And that's a win in the game of life. Very sweet piece. Thank you very much, Chris. We're going to take you now to a little shop in Minnesota that brings the art of weaving to people of all abilities. More than that, it's given them a place to thrive. Here's Susan Elizabeth Littlefield with the story. Inside this Annandale shop, you'll find an array of bright inventory. We do all kinds of stuff here. We do rugs, placemats, table runners. And an array of dazzling humans. We have someone who's cutting off the loom. Skilled weavers who finish a piece, then start a celebration. Mandy! This is really a joyful place. Um, we're about jobs with dignity, we're about social connection, and there's joy. You can feel it in the air. Elizabeth and her husband started the place three years ago. It's a place where people of all different learning styles can create. They spend months on their projects. Oh, that looks like a lot of work. It is. Annika is one of the artists on staff. What do you feel like inside when you're in the space? Happy and safe and like that I can actually do something out of my creativity. It's where Abby Welter, Annandale's homecoming queen, shares her creativity too. And you're a weaver. Yes, I am a weaver. And an artist. I am artist. And you're good. I'm good too. And these good artists are simultaneously building self-worth. Ms. Michael explains. And all these years, I just wanted to be an artist when I grow up. And here I am. My dreams have finally come true. And they have more than art to show for it. Turns out, as hard as their hands are working, their brains are working even harder. I believe it's part of the right and left, the crossing midline that we have them do when they're weaving. And it fires both sides of their brain. Because creativity comes with great responsibility. When he started, it was yes, no, maybe. Uh. And now, the boy who three years ago barely spoke is basically the program's spokesperson. Well, it's a job full of dignity, and Annandale Art and Textile Center is a joyful place. Yes, it is. Another lovely story there. All right, coming up in just a moment, for four years now, carpenters have been restoring the iconic Notre Dame spire after it was damaged in that devastating fire. Well, now the spire is set to rise again. Four years ago now, a fire tore through Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. I'm sure you remember the pictures. Most of the church structure did survive, but its famous 19th century spire was destroyed in the flames. Since then, hundreds of carpenters have worked to reconstruct it and as Elaine Cobb shows us, it will once again soon rise. 
Four years ago, the world looked on in horror as Notre Dame was engulfed in flames. The cathedral's massive timber roof was lost to the fire. The iconic spire, made of oak and metal, was destroyed. Soon, though, it will rise again over Paris. Deep in the French countryside, teams of artisans measure, saw and chisel centuries-old oak to rebuild the spire to its original design, combining the methods of the past with the tools of today. A crane lowers another piece of the puzzle into what will soon be a 300-foot spire in the presence of the man in charge of the project, General Jean-Louis Georgelin. It's a, it's, it's a very emotional time because the reconstruction of the spire is the key phase of the reconstruction of the cathedrals since the fire. The shaft is now complete, but work on the main body of the spire continues. Architect Axel Ponsonet has been working on the reconstruction for two years. I'm extremely proud to be part of this team and to rebuild Notre Dame, but it's also a very interesting project because it's a very complex structure and never today we are rebuilding such structures. And what's amazing is that we are really trying to be very uh, specific in the way we rebuilt it. So, Is it going to be just as it was? Yes, it's going to be just as it was. We are, the, the design is traditional, the, the knowledge is traditional, but the techniques are modern. The timber came from forests across France, like this one we visited two years ago, where only the tallest oak trees, at least a hundred years old, were chosen. The architects call this the heart of the spire. 285 pieces of oak are assembled in complex patterns to form the shaft. In the next few weeks, it will be taken to Paris and placed on the roof of the cathedral, as shown to CBS 60 Minutes. French President Emmanuel Macron promised that Notre Dame would reopen to the public in 2024. General Georgelin is confident they will meet that deadline. I do my best. Every minute in my life is dedicated to that. Work on the spire continues until the end of this year, when it is expected to soar again into the Paris skyline. Nothing carpenters can't do. All right, coming up in just a moment, when you get ice cream, particularly in summertime, one scoop or two, what kind of guy are you? How about 42? That's Dana Jacobson taking us on an epic ice cream trail through New Hampshire. 42 different shops dishing out the sweet treat, plus something more. There's a trail in New Hampshire that's become quite a summer attraction, but this is not a hiking trail, it's an ice cream trail. Dana Jacobson has more. Hey, here you are. It is a snapshot of summer. Thank you. Comes in all flavors and sizes. Largest are 12 ounces. Okay. And as good as ice cream looks. Oh, there's a key lime. Thank you. And it comes nowhere near as good. Mint chip. As it tastes. Best mint chip ever. At Richardson's Ice Cream in Bosco in New Hampshire. Black raspberry. Here we go. Cheers. Megan Call filled my stepson Jack and me with more than a few craving inducing bites of some of their 61 flavors. Coffee Oreo is one of the most popular ones I do. I don't know if I can ever drink real coffee because I'll just think of this and it'll be a disappointment. <laughs> it's so creamy. That's the I fun of making it yourself. That. You can control it the way you want it. We want it nice and creamy. Ooh because if you're not gonna do it the old fashioned way from scratch, why bother? And I didn't have to take Megan's word for it. So we start with two and a half gallons of ice. She gave me a quick tutorial on how they make their ice cream. See, and I said I didn't want to spill any. Ah, keep going. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. A banana chip in this case. You gotta lean the bowl up here. And while it wasn't a top secret process. This feels like a two person project. It is how Richardson's has been making ice cream since the 1950s when selling milk wasn't enough to keep the family farm going, according to Jim Richardson, who says, yes, you can taste the Richardson difference. We start with raw milk, raw cream. We have a blend of sugars and milk solids. 
we've developed over the years that we're happy with, and our ice cream base is exactly where we want it to be. And even if that means nothing to me, I'm going to taste it. And that, I'll know the difference. <laughs> You're darn well better. Richardson's rich history, one of the things that makes it unique among the shops you'll find on the New Hampshire ice cream trail. Which ice cream place do we check out today? <laughs> A part of the journey since the trail started 10 years ago. We're out in the middle of nowhere. It does bring people here. Once they've found us, if they're within 40 miles of us, they tend to come back. A plus for business. Wow, looks delicious. And welcome challenge for the mom and pop shop with Jim, his wife Sue, and Megan, the only full-time workers. We're stretched pretty thin, but I enjoy what I'm doing. About 15 miles down the road in San Bernton, you'll find a similar mindset at Miltuck Farm and Creamery. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, there's never a bad day making ice cream. Like, compared to being a firefighter. Lori Miller is a former Phoenix firefighter who opened up her ice cream stand just a year ago. Yeah, one scoop of the pineapple. One... Her wife Liz, their kids, even mother-in-law, a part of what she says was a dream. I'm like a big dreamer, right? So I just got this idea that we were going to start this little ice cream shop. I'm going to do the waffle ball. I had a vision. We were very specific with wanting an environment where people could come and sit. Right? Bring That's your kids. That's literally what this is. Eat ice cream. Good ice cream brings people from everywhere. From the lines we saw, the idea has caught on, and not just with the locals. I don't think we'd be here without the ice cream trail. Really? Yeah, we get as equal amount of like regulars and town folk as we do people just experiencing the ice cream trail. Especially as a first year. Yep. They visit. have their maps. I'm intrigued by the way they do it. Some of them are like, I want the chocolate chip. That's what I get at every single place. Right? And they're kind of gauging which ones have the best flavor. Speaking of, Miltuck had around 16 the day we visited. I don't know if you can take all that down, but I, good I, will, do, I will do my best. You know, Lori currently learning the ice cream craft from an industry veteran. And from my double scoop, made up of coffee Oreo cookie and grape nut, her apprenticeship is going rather well. Get it? Really Miltuck Farm and Creamery and Richardson's are just two of the 42 shops on this year's New Hampshire ice cream trail. It runs as far north as Pittsburgh's Moose Alley Cones, about 14 miles from the Canadian border, with shops dotting the freeways and back roads throughout the state. Cities like Keene, Concord, Manchester, and Nashua laying claim to the bulk. Today we're here right on a dairy farm. One right. of our New Hampshire dairy farmers owns this. Amy Hall is the director of the Granite State Dairy Promotion. The group started the ice cream trail a decade ago to raise awareness about New Hampshire's dairy farmers. One of my favorite things to say is no cows, no ice cream. <laughs> and you know, it, it's 100% true. You know, in 1970, we had over 800 family owned dairy farms here in New Hampshire. Today in 2023, we have 90 left. Including, as mentioned, the one we were on, Ilsley's, where Lisa Ilsley is a fifth generation dairy farmer. We milk about 15 cows, so it's it's a real That's small really farm small, right? in, you know, in the grand scheme of, of dairy farming. It's in your blood. Once a dairy farmer, always a dairy farmer. We love it, and I knew that I really needed to do something besides just milking the cows and shipping the milk wholesale, so that's why I started um, the ice cream stand. Here we are nine years later, and we're still going strong. This is chocolate, right? because they have very good chocolate here. Mike Atkinson is one of many who discovered Ilsley's thanks to the New Hampshire ice cream trail. You've completed it now how many years? I have completed it three years, um, and I have participated in it every year since 2016. And that's not all. When his completed map book was mailed in and randomly selected last year, Mike became the grand prize winner, receiving an Eat Like a Cow sweatshirt, an array of New Hampshire products, and a small gift card. But Mike is quick to point out the real prize is found in the journey. Sometimes you don't stop to think, well, let's do something that's a little bit different. And so to go find someplace new and discover a little bit more of the state. That's what this helps you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's been the best part of this journey that you've taken year after year? I really get a kick out of meeting the people. And some of the stores are really, really unique. One of the stores, they didn't have anybody there. You walk in, take your ice cream out of the freezer, put your money in get an envelope. Out. I'm serious as a heart attack. 
Put your money in an envelope and drop it in the box. That's awesome. That's old time New Hampshire. Yeah. And after all these years, Mike admits there's also a practical takeaway from the trail. Are you really eating ice cream at every stop? I get smalls. <laughs> The first Did you do that right away, or you made no. a mistake like me right away? <laughs> no, I learned really quick, don't get the large, don't get a frap, don't get a banana split. Get the small ice cream. Right. If you're eating a banana split at every stop, it hurts. But you'll do that sometime. I, sometimes I do have to get a banana split. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't we all? That is our show. I hope it brightened your day and lifted you up. If it didn't for some reason, go ahead and get an extra scoop of ice cream tonight. I gave you permission. It's in the freezer. Meantime, I'm going to go find some more good news.